Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to the Coffee, Health, and Science podcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in again today. Before we get started, I urge you, of course, to share the Coffee, Health, and Science podcast. Tell a coffee lover or someone interested in health science. We appreciate you spreading the show. And of course, use code CHSPODCAST at puritycoffee.com. That'll get you big savings on scientifically roasted for health. Uh, The best coffee in the world, if I may say so myself, in my humble opinion. Today, we have a brand new guest. Very excited to speak to this individual. Uh, You all know that I work in regenerative agriculture and like to really interview farmers of different types, different walks of life. Uh, And today, we're going into a farming style that we haven't really covered before too much. Um, we are speaking with an aquaponics expert today. He's really more than that. He's a soil scientist and, and so much more, but cut his teeth in the aquaponics world. Uh, we're going to dive into all that and what that means. Steve Raisner is on the line with us. How you doing, Steve? Good. How are you doing? Doing excellent, man. A pleasure to speak with you on this uh, platform. Really, really excited to talk with you. Um, for the uninitiated, though, can you talk a little bit about uh, your farming background What brought you into aquaponics and what led you to eventually travel the world and consult on these different farms with uh, different farmers growing aquaponically? Sure. So uh, I used to work a lot in the pet trade with koi ponds and different aquarium setups and things like that. And we eventually um, were looking at uh, ways to kind of utilize a lot of that waste. In some cases, we were remonetizing it for for gardener garden use, and then and other times we were um, uh, actually just growing uh, terrestrial plants right in that. Um, but kind of uh, basically just working off of the aquaculture end of things, and then uh, uh, ending up in, with some particular crops that uh, I don't know. If, I think you guys cover too much on this show, but uh, and then getting down that rabbit hole with with all that stuff with those crops, and then. Um, uh, eventually uh, rolling over into um, the, uh, out to Colorado uh, and then working in um, the aquaponics source after the big floods hit uh, and heading up their research and development. And we grew all different types of medicinal herbs and fruit trees and bushes and uh, tried to find different types of um, more profitable crops that we could be growing for um, uh, aquaponic production in general. And uh, for those of you who don't know what aquaponics is, is Aquaponics is using fish waste or fish manure, other aquatic creatures to grow um, plants and kind of an organic hydroponic solution um, that basically uses their manure uh, to grow the plants uh, with along with lots of uh, microbes. So uh, chemically, it's very similar to like um, a living soil in terms of the biodiversity and, and things like that. So it's much, uh, it gives a much more rich flavor uh, to the crops, uh, which, you know, similarly to living soil. Wow, man. Uh, and I know you're pretty loose with your definition of aquaponics, just basically incorporating these uh, aquatic inputs, as you put them, you know, fish wastes and the microbes that come with them, incorporating that into your garden. You basically consider anything that, that focuses on that to be aquaponic, correct? Well, I generally consider anything, if they're getting 75% or more of the base nutrients uh, from those fish or fish waste, then to me that's you know more or less aquaponics. Sometimes you have people using it as their main fertigation method for their terrestrial plants. Uh, other times people are growing in a, you know, a fully aquatic solution, uh, but both of them are considered aquaponics as wow. far as their classifications go um, by a, a different food safety people. So uh, uh, either way, it ends up, as far as they're concerned, uh, It's all the same. So Wow. It is really, really interesting. This is maybe the most interesting form of farming, in my opinion. Um, So, you know, for the layperson, for the uninitiated, you're raising these fish. You have these tanks of fish and they're fat and happy and you you feed them all the best stuff and their waste is what's producing all of the minerals that you usually use with synthetic fertilizer. They're producing all the nitrogen and the potassium and the phosphorus and all this stuff. All of that comes from the fish waste and you need not want for for more fertilizers that's the idea right that's the idea yeah so we actually have it provides the vast majority of the nutrients most cases 80 to 90 percent of the nutrients and then we just need to supplement things like uh, iron which gets oxidized in the in aqueous solution or um, sometimes a little bit of calcium or potassium or other or uh, a few trace elements here and there depending on uh, you know what type of fish and fish feed is being used wow man Really, really fascinating. One of the things that stuns me the most about aquaponics is this idea that you're harvesting the fish too. So your garden is producing this protein. Um, And like I've told you before, Steve, it seems like if you can just get the electricity side figured out, if you can get on sustainable energy of some kind, 
this is the garden system that solves world hunger, right? Oh, yeah, especially for island nations and desert nations where they have a finite amount of water. You know, we use on average between 5 and 18% of the water of our traditional drain-to-waste uh, or, or soil operation, depending on the crop. Uh, so, um, you know, it can offer uh, significantly better usage of water uh, in places that are far away. And then, like when I was working in Africa, it was a way for us to provide protein in areas that was kind of otherwise kind of devoid of of easy, cheap to produce protein that also produce plants as well. So, you know, they were pr providing fertilizer and growing plants, but also having protein available uh, to the people on the farm. So wow. it kind of creates this uh, wonderful way to, you know, even if you're doing medicinal crops that, uh, um, you know, you can still feed people uh, off of that. Absolutely incredible. You were doing research and development. You were working with all these different, um, you know, organizations. Aquaponics seems like a small world. I'm sure you became a pro rather quickly. Did people just start contacting you for a consulting job? Like you said, I know you went out to Zimbabwe. Did people just write you and say, hey, I'm growing uh, basil or whatever it was out there? What did that look like? Yeah, so I, I do. I work with um, mostly large-scale organic or, or very large-scale aquaponics facilities working on their designs and things like that. And then I also work on um, uh, just troubleshooting. There's a lot of people that have set up aquaponic farms and maybe didn't get very good advice from some of the other people out there on the market. Um, so I'll go in and troubleshoot them. Uh, and then also we work with the aquaponics association. So uh, we have a, a big organization there that we work with to try and you know, stave off uh, un, uh, unnecessary regulation and, and make sure that the, the right things are being regulated and suggested to the USDA. Uh, we actually have two people we work with directly at the USDA there um, so that we can kind of move this whole thing along. Uh, and then we also have a ton of different people from different universities there and all kinds of stuff. They do a big um, presentation conference once a year and, and stuff like that. So it really is kind of a cool experience. It seems like the coolest way to grow. We're going to get in specifically about the biodiversity that comes with having these, you know, terrestrial and aquatic microbes working in conjunction with each other. Um, but first I'd love to hear maybe your favorite, uh, travel story, your favorite farm that you've worked on, uh, something aquaponics that was just, you know, really special to you. I think one of the neater farms and it's, uh, that I've seen as far as aquaponics um, was a, two of them that stuck out. So there was a farm in Wyoming that we did uh, aquatic fruit trees. So we had big giant barrels that were partially flooded at the bottom uh, and did big fruit trees in, in dual root zone pots where the top, you know, two thirds of it was soil with a layer of burlap. And then the, the bottom portion was just a regular flood and drain with lava rock. Uh, and that was really cool, setting up a bunch of different types of fruit trees. Wow. Uh, and then the other one I would say is there's a gentleman named Dutch Blooms who has a, a wonderful living soil and, and terrestrial uh, hybrid uh, uh, cannabis facility that's uh, just very unique Ooh. where he really incorporated he, he happened to have a high water table on his property, so he kind of used it to his advantage. He just dug a couple of ponds and put a stream right through the middle of his property that he can use to irrigate off of. And then he keeps and maintains a bunch of perch and bluegill in there uh, to help fertigate the place. And, you know, it's all going right back into the same water table on the property and really kind of made use of the, the particularly uh, wonderful setup that he has there naturally. Uh, wow. And, the you know, rather than that being a disadvantage is a huge advantage to him. I know the, uh, you know, the hemp industry, the cannabis industry driving a lot of this uh, microbiological research or a lot of the developments in this type of farming. Have you ever heard of coffee being grown aquaponically? Now, I've, I've looked around a lot. Personally, I haven't come across that yet. No, I, I haven't, but I, I definitely think it's possible. I think you'd probably just set them up like fruit trees or, or some of the other more woodier crops. Now, with woodier crops, they're much more reliant on mycorrhizal fungi. Um, so you want to make sure that you have a good at least 50% or 75% um, uh, soil layer uh, to a you know, smaller percentage of your flood and drain so that um, you uh, end up getting a, that, that you know, deep mycorrhizal layer that they're going to need to actually produce the lignin. The more um, woody the crop is and the more uh, lignin it produces, the more it needs of those mycorrhizae in order to thrive. Well, the listeners can write me. If you have a reason why this hasn't been done, you coffee farmers who listen, write me. But I want to know why. Are any of you growing up aquaponically? I got to try aquaponically grown coffee because like you're saying, maybe back to the fruit trees, it's, this is the tastiest um, way to farm as far as, as far as expression of all the sugars and plant, ex yeah, just the stuff we're looking for in coffee, all the phytochemicals, right? All the good plant stuff. This really brings that out of crops. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, definitely. You have uh, significantly more biodiversity 
than most of the, than pretty much any other method by having the terrestrial soil microbes and the aquatic soil microbes uh, all together in uh, you know one root system. So it really can provide the the widest array of secondary metabolite production, which gives you those flavor compounds and alkaloids and uh, other things that are in the coffee that uh, make it taste good. The uh, fruit, did you find it to be the same thing? What fruit were you growing out in that, uh, that, that operation you mentioned? And was it just like the tastiest fruit ever? Sure, yeah. We were doing Saturn, pe- Saturn peaches. Mm-hmm. And then we also had um, a couple of avocado trees. But most of it was indoor peaches. And then they also had, um, what was the other one? Saturn peaches and something else. I think it was some type of um, uh, ornamental pear, like fancy, funky pears that look like red apples. I I, I've only seen them in Jamaica, aside from that facility. So, oh man, that sounds amazing! And just uh, are are the is the sweetness uh, off the chain? Oh yeah, super super sweet. Yep, for sure. Always have that extra sweetness. And some of the other crops that we grow as well are are very very flavorful. Even the lettuce and stuff like that that we grow is just has significantly you know more flavor profile than than. Uh, you know, most of the soil stuff that you get, are certainly the hydro stuff you get from the grocery store. Oh yeah. Now what about, um, what, what about what you feed the fish? Does that contribute to the flavor? I'm sure that contributes to the nutrition, which, which must alter that somehow. Have you done a lot of playing with, Hey, feed the fish that and end up with this? Sure. To a, to a lesser extent. So you have, um, uh, the more protein that's in the food, the more nitrogen you're going to get out of it. So oh. if you're trying to grow nitrogen-heavy crops, you go with more carnivores or a higher-protein-based um, uh, feed, whereas if you're growing flowering crops, you want to do more omnivores or a more balanced feed, um, you know, protein to, to vegetables in order to get the best uh, profile out of that. Mm, interesting. Very interesting. And you're, you're allowed to grow all sorts of delicious fish in that aquaponics, uh, aquaculture tank, right? Like tilapia and, um, what yeah. else do you, what else do you raise sure. in there? So typically with most of the setups that I do, we'll have, you know, two to four algae eaters and then we'll have, you know, four to six bottom feeders, a catfish or something else that's going to cruise near the bottom to keep the waste moving in, into the water column. Uh, and just if anything hits the bottom and doesn't get eaten, then they still, eat, you know, pick it up. And then we'll put our main main fish in. So then we'll have yellow perch or bluegill or um, koi or, you know, whatever it is that makes sense in that market. You know, each market's different. Yeah, that is very, very interesting. The protein source that comes, you know, accompanying the aquaponics garden. Um, I really want to dig into this this idea and and get get you to break down for the listener why the microbiological stimulation is important you know you talked about growing basil to a certain point when we were talking you you grow this basil it's producing a plant oil or a series of compounds that gives it that aroma that gives it that flavor and anyone who's grown a garden at home and, and grown organically at home and grown a tomato and bitten into it knows that difference of those flavor compounds uh, for, from the sterile uh, factory farmed store-bought tomato versus the homegrown one. I know there's a lot of differences there in the entire process, but I would love to dig into specifically the farming practice. Why is it that microbiologically rich um, soils that plants are grown in end up in a more flavorful fruit? Can you describe that process for, for the listener? Sure. So, um, and there's a lot of documentation on this as well. You guys can look up. There's a bunch of different white papers on soy and wheat and corn and stuff like that uh, as far as how a lot of this stuff works. But the, the plant has different genes in its immune system that are responsible for secondary metabolites. And the reason why the plant wastes energy on secondary metabolites is that it, it, it's like that's its defense mechanism. So stuff for fighting off fungi or insects or protecting itself from the environment from UV exposure or from cold, or from just whatever it is that's, you know, potentially damaging to the plant in some way. Um, so that's why the plant creates those compounds. So um, uh, that's why you see certain plants, you know, increase in color uh, from cold temperature swings, and or um, uh, why you have, uh, uh, why you see so many problems in, in crops that are planted in the dead fields 
uh, that are sprayed with all the chemical uh, mm. crap, with all the herbicides and pesticides that kills off all the fungi and everything in the soil, uh, they're much more susceptible to things like septor septoria or pith, you know, fusarium or botrytis because the, those plants have never seen fungi before. They don't know how to defend themselves against fungi. They're even mildly pathogenic. So as soon as the first one comes along, they get infected. It's like taking a little kid and, and putting them in a bubble and then taking them in a time square when they turn 21 and expecting them not to get sick in 48 wow. hours. Like it's just not going to work. Right. Whereas if you have a good, healthy soil, uh, the plant can be exposed to all kinds of microbes early on. It's kind of like that kid getting his vac you know, his, his vaccines and getting exposed to chicken pox at a young age and, you know, getting the flu a couple of times as a kid and kind of building up the immune system, uh, rather than, uh, you know, expecting it to just work without any kind of uh, training right it's yeah, like you couldn't run a marathon without any kind of training it's that same kind of thing whereas um, that's the reason why the plant produces those so it'll produce you know time will produce um you know uh, thymol in order to help def against insect defense and um you know you have um uh, la uh lavender will produce linalol to defend itself against insects and and things like that so you have uh you know, all these different ones that, um, you know, ha are things that we're after in essential oil compounds and essential oil production. Um, I mean, uh, you, we talked about um, coffee, you know, coffee produces caffeine, again, as an insect deterrent. Um, you know, Is we that just happen right? To enjoy I didn't, I haven't heard that yeah. before. Yep. It actually really screws with the nervous systems of grasshoppers. Wow. I didn't know that's why caffeine was produced in coffee cherries, that it's actually to fight yeah, I mean, everything is basically a survival mechanism is what you're saying. All of these, yep. one way or another, it's a survival mechanism. What interests yep. me is that you keep saying immune system. It's tied to the immune system, which isn't, um, you know, something that you might, you might originally think about. That's very fascinating. Well, it makes sense if you think about it in that context of like, you know, exposing the plant to non-pathogenic microbes to stimulate its immune system to create it more secondary compounds. It's kind of like getting your shots and, 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 um, you know, stimulating your immune system and, or even just being exposed into a school or something like that as a kid and, and having that exposure to those other pathogens that exactly. aren't going to kill you, but are going to help train your, your immune system. It's, it's that same kind of uh, thing that gets those plants to produce more and more of those compounds. We had uh, Dr. Richard Layton on, and he's an allergen expert, and he said the exact same thing. You know, allergen experts have done a 180 on recommendations within my lifetime. For a minute there, it was like, because peanut allergies were going off the charts, and for a minute there, it was like, don't feed your newborns peanuts. Keep them away from the peanuts. Don't give them peanut butter. That's what's causing all this problem. Turns out they've completely 180 Expose them to peanuts. Expose them to peanuts as soon as you can, because apparently if you get that exposure early, uh, you're much like much less likely to have that type of allergy and many more different types of allergies. Same with studies done on kids that grew up around livestock or with a pet in the home or all these sorts of things. You got to get kind of exposed to the stuff to build up a resistance to the stuff. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so yeah, it's just interesting to see that on a uh, again a kind of rhizosphere level. It's all happening under the soil and ends up in increase compounds of what we want i really want to i really want to kind of unlock the key with this idea and coffee because coffee produces hundreds of different compounds hundreds of different acids and you know malic acid and chlorogenic acid and, and trigonaline and and all these different compounds that we really don't know how they work all uh, why they work all together but they do work all together and i want to figure out what type of uh, immune system stimulation what type of microbiological stimulation we can introduce to the plant to maybe get these levels up or certain levels up and make healthier coffee. Um, we definitely grow organically because we know that that's just a better way to do it. But I wonder if, do you think there's corresponding reactions, right? Like a specific species of beneficial bacteria, maybe increasing mm -hmm. a specific compound. Does that make sense in your estimation or no? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and as we, you know, especially with, uh, uh, the advent of the uh, the global pandemic that we're currently going through, uh, rapid DNA testing has really come down in price, and I think you're going to start to be able to to test for the uh, you know look at the plant and see what genes are activated, and then see what secondary compounds have, have dramatically increased, uh, and then correlate those two together in order to um, you know uh, uh, map that out. But that's wow. something that it takes a lot of data uh, and a lot of samples and a lot of time. And a lot of 
testing in order to suss out. And you're seeing this starting to happen now in some other uh, other crops as well, where they're figuring out exactly what needs to be added and and looking at you know. Uh, there's a great example with hemp where um, if you have a powdery mildew present, it increases a, a secondary compound called CBL, uh, which is really interesting. So you're you're seeing some of the stuff getting mapped out in other crops, and I think it's a matter of time before you know they'll be able to you know suss out specific microbial mixes that they'll apply to the fields. Uh, you know, at specific times in order to maximize uh, production of those types of things. Um, I also think, you know, things like Korean natural farming uh, and introducing indigenous microorganisms to these regions as well um, uh, and applying them to your your crops is going to also be uh, you know, highly beneficial to people growing coffee specifically. Oh, that's great, man. You bring up KNF. I know that you um, ha- are our friends and, and are a fan of Chris Trump, who's come on this show before and really opened our eyes um, you know, he, he's working on macadamia farms out in, in Hawaii. And that interests a lot of growers because, uh, you know, the coffee growers grow coffee in Hawaii as well. So, yeah, the Korean natural works, farming really seems to be the future. He, he worked with a coffee farm, too, in Southeast Asia. It was Burma or Vietnam or one of them. That's right. That's somewhere right. Somewhere in Indonesia. I don't remember which one, but somewhere in Southeast Asia. Truly changing the world, like getting these farmers off of synthetic fertilizers, making their, their own uh, mineral inputs. It's, it's absolutely incredible to see. Um, Steve, if somebody wants to reach out to you and maybe they need help on their farm, maybe they're trying to regenerate some land or maybe they're in aquaponics, um, you know, they're struggling with aquaponics. Where can they reach you to, to talk to you about your consulting work? Sure. You can email me at potentponics at gmail.com. Um, you can also find my YouTube over at Potent Ponics, uh, on there. I have quite a bit of vegetable and non-vegetable, uh, content on there. So Potent Ponics, that's a nice brand name you have worked out there. I mean, it's definitely a, um, a fascinating growing style. Now having seen these operations up close and personal, I mean, there's a reason you call it better than organic. You know, it, it, it provides, uh, everything you could need as the gardener from the crop and the protein and then to the plant as well with the terrestrial land inputs and then the aquatic fish inputs. I believe it's the best, man. You've convinced me, Steve. Oh, yeah. And it, it really is, you know, you kind of have the, like I was saying before, the fact that you can provide protein to local communities regardless of what your crop choice is really can be a game di- uh, a game changer in a lot of areas, but also using a lot less water at the same time. You know, again, Barbados, Jamaica, uh, St. Vincent, um, the Cayman Islands, all these are great places that really highly benefit from technology like this and, uh, you know, really can make a huge difference in the food production there. I absolutely love it, man. Before we wrap it up, I got one more question, actually. How do regulators take a look at aquaponics? Do they consider it organic? Do they give you trouble because you have this weird growing style, or are they kind of cool with it? <laughs> uh, so uh, as far as organic certification goes, we are uh, uh, every two to four years having to defend it, to uh, you know, basically in a, uh, a hearing at the USDA because they're bunch of soil guys really don't like the fact that we're allowed to be called organic but if you look at it on every metric that they use um it's organic we on average we average 168 percent more species biodiversity in the root systems of of plants on average in an aquaponics versus living soil system Um, so they can't claim that it's less biodiverse Uh, we use less water uh, and all of our stuff is mineralized and we actually for every 10,000 square foot of um uh, production that we do for lettuce uh, that metric I can speak of uh, uh, offhand from memory. Um, we produce about 2,000 pounds of living soil each year from the composted plant material, the fish waste uh, that's not used, uh, and everything else uh, in the form of vermicompost that we we feed to the worms. So we have we actually produce you know more soil than we we utilize uh, or or use. So you know if we're producing that much soil per year. Uh, and we use less water, and we're more biodiverse, I think that makes it extremely hard for anyone to say that it's not organic uh, by any metric. Yeah, that's right. I had almost forgotten um, recently seeing with you the results of just dumping your excess fish waste out into the into the field and what those uh, bacterial kind of accumulations do to regenerate that soil just from your excess fish waste. That's pretty crazy, man. And um and yeah, like you said, you literally have to go take these people to court, right? Like, haven't you haven't you done this? You, you've had to fight this legal battle before with research papers oh, yeah. and all this stuff? Oh, yeah. So I helped submit data with the Aquaponics Association 
uh, for two separate rounds of hearings where the uh, the aquaponic or the soil people tried to claim that it wasn't uh, certifiable and each time we proved that there was no food safety issues university of hawaii has a, like an eight-year study on food safety um, we also are now switching over to doing proactive food safety so we're dosing with lactobacillus in all of our systems now um, which completely eliminates things like e coli and salmonella and things like that while increasing you know plant growth rates with uh, you know, their secondary metabolites uh, and, and metabolites are one of them is a form of vitamin B, which just helps plants grow faster. So it ends up being really kind of a great, uh, um, a great thing all around no kidding. Uh, for not only food safety, but just for increasing fish health and plant health uh, at the same time. Well, Steve, we are uh, we are absolutely sold. Again, we're going to have to have you back on. Maybe we'll talk more KNF. We'll get an update on this aquaponics coffee scenario because... I would love to see what type of flavor compounds come out of aquaponic coffee. I can only imagine, man. So, uh, so yeah, thank you. You have to send me a little uh, coffee tree or something. I'll, we'll see what it does. Uh, I'm, I'm all the way in. It's definitely going to happen now. Uh, Dr. Coffee definitely heard that. Get you, uh, get you a green bean and we'll, we'll get going, man. Thank you for coming on the show today, Steve. You're always such a great source of uh, knowledge when it comes to this evolving field of soil biology. And uh, again, Potent Ponics on Instagram. Get at him, everybody. If you need a consult, if you need to understand soil science better, uh, he is the best. Thank you, Steve. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody. That's the show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I know you enjoyed it. We'll see you next time. This is Steve Raisner and Jordan River signing off, saying have an extraordinary day, everybody. And we'll see you next time on the Coffee Health and Science Podcast.